Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the issues that's faced by any hedonistic theory has to do with the kinds of human relationships that we often call friendships. And, you know, we have different names for different modalities of this, but there's some general idea that we have of friendship, of having relationships that, that matter to us, where the individual person or the group of people who we're connected with matter as those persons. And we, we want to spend time in their company. We want to do things with them. And there's some sort of interchange back and forth, not only of enjoyment, but even of, you know, helping each other out of what, what were you know, called services or offices in ancient times. Now, for an Epicurean and for any hedonist, um, one of the criticisms that's going to be made against them is that they don't really take into account the value of friendship. And so the, that's what we're asking about. What is the value of friendship for an Epicurean? And why would other people be criticizing the Epicureans on this point? Well, Epicureans are saying that pleasure is the good, with a capital T, capital G, pain is the bad. So if, if pleasure is the good, then, it, you know, for, for things like, you know, this piece of chalk, it, whatever value it has for me is just the pleasure that I get from it. And that seems perfectly fine for food and drink and, and other sorts of things as well. But you know, we tend not to like that idea when it comes to people. If we say, why am I friends with that person? Well, because I get some pleasure from them. Why am I not friends with that person? Well, because, you know, I, I don't get pleasure from them. They're not giving something to me. It sounds kind of selfish. It sounds kind of like friendships for Epicureans or for other hedonists are just a matter of what you can get out of the other person. So if two people can get something out of each other, they can mutually use each other, they have mutual usefulness, then um, they can be friends. But it doesn't go any further than that. And we see that in the ancient world, and I think in the medieval and the modern world as well, some people have always said, look, friendship in the real sense, in the fullest sense, is not just reducible to what you get out of the friend, you know, their usefulness for, for something, or even the pleasure that you get from them. There has to be some other type of value. So the question is, is Epicurus actually able to take account of this? So we'll, we'll answer that. First, though, I want to read a few passages that I think are, are particularly important. Um, in the, the principal doctrines, there's not an awful lot of discussion of friendship. Um, he does say, though, the same conviction which inspires confidence that nothing we have to fear is eternal or even of long duration also enables us to see that even in our limited conditions of life, nothing enhances our security so much as friendship. So that sounds more or less like, you know, we're, we're using people, we're trying to get something out of them. Uh, we're going to talk about, about that sort of um, case in, in just a moment. Um, friendship is, is something that's being suggested to us as prudent, right? And he also says, of all the means which are pro procured by wisdom or prudence to ensure happiness throughout the whole of life, by far the most important is the acquisition of friends. So it makes it sound like a friend is somebody who is particularly useful, not just at one moment, but, but through the whole of our life. And in the Vatican sayings, um, he says, friendship dances around the world, bidding us all to awaken to the recognition of happiness. Um, beautiful phrase there. Does he mean it just in the sense of friendship is probably the best means that we have to, you know, make sure that we have what we need during life so we can feel happy by enjoying pleasures? Not necessarily with this person or that person, 
uh, who they are, you know, in themselves, but, you know, the, the functions that they perform. Well, you know, in the Vatican sayings, he also tells us um, a few other things as well that we're going to get to. He says, every friendship in itself is to be desired, but the initial cause of friendship is from its advantages. So what we've got here is a doctrine that says the initial cause of friendship, how friendship comes about in the first place, in, you know, in the abstract and also in particular circumstances, is really a matter of people finding each other useful, that is by, you know, the, you know warding off pains and, and, and providing each other pleasures. But we go on from there to make friendship something, Epicurus would say, intrinsically valuable, you know. Um, every friendship in itself is to be desired. Insofar as it's really a friendship, it is something desirable. It is something that we ought to pursue. So let's talk about this initial cause of friendship. Um, it, it lies in the usefulness, the advantage of friendship. What are those advantages? Well, he says that friends are people that we find pleasant. Makes perfect sense, right? You, you like hanging out with somebody, you eventually become friends with them. Uh, you don't like hanging out with somebody, don't hang out with them, Epicurus would say. Because, you know, it's, it's not enjoyable. Pain is, is a bad thing. Um, he also says that we rely on friends to help us out in times of need. That's one of the functions of friendship. You can tell who's really your friend when they're put to the test. Like, you know, when you got to move, who's actually willing to come and help you, pa you know, pack stuff up and hoof the boxes down the fourth flight of stairs and take you to the other place, um, knowing that all they're going to get is maybe some beer and pizza and thanks in, in, in return. Um, when they could be spending their Saturday or their Sunday doing something else. Well, Epicurus says something else that's very interesting about this. He says that it's not so much that we, we need the friend. The advantage doesn't lie just in the fact that they do do stuff for us. We want to be able to rely on them, and insofar as we actually feel like we can rely on them, we may never need to rely on them. It helps us ward off uh, mental pains, fears, troubles, anxieties in having friends as a kind of resource that we could turn to, even if we never have to turn to them. They make our lives better by just being there. As a matter of fact, he's got a nice um, saying here in the Vatican sayings, um, talking about how we ought to um, how we ought to treat our friends when things have, have gone wrong. He says that um, when we're trying to you know, sympathize with our friends, um, what, we, what we need to do is actually just be understanding. We need to give them, nowadays we would say, we need to allow them to listen. We need to listen to them, rather, right? I'm going to give you the opportunity to listen. No, we listen to them, and we're, we're sympathetic with them. Um, he also says... The person who's always seeking out help, they're not actually a friend. Nor is the person who never does seek help. There's something involved in friendship, the, the act of actually going to somebody else and saying, hey, hey can, can you help me out here? Um, not too much of it, not too little of it. The right amount is what generates friendship. And that's part of its advantage. Um, you know, if we want to spell this out further, we could say that that's part of what it is for us to be human beings is to be creatures that relate to each other in such a way. Now, Epicurus is also going to say friendship becomes something pleasurable in its own sake. Insofar as there's anything intrinsically valuable, you know, valuable on its own account, it is pleasure, or it's the things that actually provide us with pleasure, the things that are pleasurable, and he says that friendship becomes that way. It's, you know, we start out by being friends with people because they give us pleasure, but after a while, the very fact of being in the relationship with them uh, uh, attains a certain value. So he says, um, what, what is that value? Well, part of it consists in those close to us, the, the thing that we, we enjoy, when we are of one mind, he says, or aiming at that, that state. So there's a kind of enjoyableness 
in feeling, in thinking, in desiring, in choosing the same way with other people. You know, when you're in sync with them, like when you're on a, on a team and you're doing things very well and, you know, things are actually coming together and you feel like you're, you're actually of one mind, so to speak. Uh, you know, I, I pass the, the ball and the other person gets it and they, they do the layup for the basket or however it's going to be, right? I kick the ball and somebody else kicks the goal or I steal the ball. I was always a fullback. When I played soccer, I steal the ball and send it upfield to the halfback who gets it to the forward who gets it into the goal, right? That can be the being of one mind. Researchers who are working together on a common project and gradually coming to a convergence of understanding. There's something really enjoyable about that. Uh, musicians who are playing together in a band, uh, you know, when egos don't get in the way and break up the band, right? Um, when you're making music together, it's very delightful. He actually calls friendship, and this is very interesting for somebody who says there is no immortality for human beings. He calls friendship an immortal good. Wisdom is a mortal good. Friendship is an immortal good. There's something that survives beyond the death in terms of friendship for Epicurus. Um, and, you know, if you look at his last will and testament, he actually did provide for his friends and their children in, in his will. Um, he also says that we place a high value on our own character. That's something that's intrinsically uh, valuable to us, or it should be. And then uh, this shows you how far friendship extends for him. He says we also place a high value on the character of our friends. Now, that's not going to necessarily happen at the initial stage where friendship is on the basis of utility, you know. Can you give me some pleasure? Um, you know, we can think about this in terms of dating, right? If you have a, um, you know, if you're concerned with your character, you want to be a good person, and you date somebody, <clears throat> and you go out on a few dates, and now you're, you know, you're enjoying each other's company in whatever way that you're happening to do that. You're deriving pleasure. It maybe doesn't matter so much at the beginning how they feel, what their, their you know, hierarchy of values are, what, what they're willing to sacrifice, what they're not willing to sacrifice. But as time goes on, if you want that relationship to deepen, to become more intimate, if you want to enjoy greater pleasure with them, then you really do need to not only be on the same page, but be concerned with each other's character, Epicurus would say. Without that, you don't really have genuine friendship. Some friendships might remain just at this level. Deeper friendships, the friendships that are much more valuable, much more pleasurable, those are the ones that are down here that have these characteristics. So from an Epicurean hedonist perspective, at least, friendship can, although it doesn't necessarily always have, but it can have an intrinsic value uh, of itself that goes beyond mere usefulness. Uh, it still involves pleasure, because these are hedonist theories, right? So pleasure is it. But friendship becomes one of the highest, one of the most enjoyable kinds of pleasure, one of the most lasting, one of the deepest, one of the securest pleasures available for human beings. So that's why it has such a great role in human happiness.